Good morning and welcome as we gather together for our Sunday morning service. And as we begin our service this morning, let us take a moment and go to God in prayer. Dear Lord God, speak to us that we might hear your call and respond with our lives. Mold us in your image, fashion us for your service, form us in your likeness, and breathe in us the spirit of love, the spirit in whom we lift our prayers this day. We lift up all of these things as we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's affirmation of faith is an affirmation from Romans chapter 8, verse 35 and verses 37 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors. Through the one who loved us, we are sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus our Lord, thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, as we gather together, let us take a few moments and to remember names and situations that we lift up with our joys and concerns. And we will have a brief moment of silent prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's reading, as you follow along, comes from the Old Testament in 1 Samuel. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family. 
from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we gather together today on this Sunday, I wanted to take a moment and start off with this illustration. The year after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, I was a third grader in Ridgeland, Mississippi. I lived in a segregated world, separate and unequal. Everybody I knew wanted things to stay the way they were. The white people in my hometown didn't understand what Dr. King preached. We didn't hear what he heard God say. We didn't hear God say anything we didn't want to hear. I knew that there were African Americans living nearby, but we went to different schools, different stores, different post offices, and saddest of all, different churches. And then one Friday afternoon, Mr. Williams, our bus driver, told us to sit down and get quiet. Starting on Monday, he yelled, there will be two black girls riding on our bus. Many of the boys in the back started booing. And Mr. Williams yelled, get quiet. I don't like it either, but there's nothing we can do about it. None of you will have to sit by them. They will sit in this seat right behind me. And then he started the bus. The bad kids said that they would call the new girls names and let them know that they didn't belong on our bus. The good kids said that that wasn't fair and that the best thing to do was to say nothing at all. On Monday and on the days that followed, as far as I know, none of the bad kids ever said anything loud enough to be heard. But something no less tragic took place. The first children on the bus each morning and each afternoon sat in the back now. Every day for the rest of the year, the bus filled from the back with every white child sitting as far as possible from the two children sitting in the front seat. It's embarrassing to say, but years passed before I realized how evil we were. It didn't occur to me to sit on the second row, say hello, or question our actions. As the good white children of good white parents, we didn't think of ourselves as bigots. We just found it easier not to challenge what was expected. Years later, I became what my relatives in Mississippi considered a liberal. The liberal white children of the Deep South who left home are proud of the alienation we feel from the most embarrassing parts of our roots. We are arrogant about our newfound sophistication, but sometimes I wonder what we would hear if we listened for God's opinion on the subject of our prejudices. It's easier not to listen to God. 
because listening is dangerous. And it was for Samuel as well. He grew up in the church helping Eli with chores around the temple. Samuel never thought about listening for God because no one was listening for God. It is written, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. It's not surprising that when 12-year-old Samuel hears a voice while sleeping in church, he was neither the first nor the last to sleep in church. He assumes it is Eli. Three times someone calling his name awakens him. Three times he goes to Eli and asks what he wants. And after the third time, Eli wonders, although God hasn't been heard from in those parts for some time, if perhaps Samuel is hearing God's voice. He tells Samuel that if he hears the voice again, he should answer, God, I am listening. God speaks and gives Samuel disturbing news, news that Samuel doesn't want to repeat. And after he hears God's voice, Samuel's life is never the same. It is harder. Martin Luther King Jr.'s father and grandfather, great-grandfather, and brother and uncle were all preachers. And when he became pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, however, he still did not have a first-hand experience of God. But then Rosa Parks refused to go to the back of the bus, and Martin found himself in the middle of a boycott. And although he had only been in Montgomery a year, and he was only 27 years old, he quickly became a leader of the movement. It wasn't long before his family started getting threatening phone calls. He wondered if he could take it. He wanted out. And then one night, around midnight, Another threatening call came. We are tired of you, and if you are not out of this town in three days, we are going to blow your brains out and blow up your house. Dr. King spent time in prayer. He prayed aloud that night. He reports hearing a voice calling him to stand up for righteousness and justice and truth. The voice of Jesus promising to be with him through the fight. Dr. King's life from that moment on is a testimony to his response to that prayer. For us, brothers and sisters, what would we hear if we listened for God's voice? Would God tell us to be honest about the prejudices that lie so deep within us that we don't admit them even to ourselves? To repent not only of whatever hatred we feel, but also whatever apathy we hide. To let worship get to our hearts enough for us to say, Speak, God, for I am listening. To realize that if racism seems like someone else's problem, then we are part of the problem. To stop waiting for others to take the first step and step across the lines ourselves to speak with kindness and courage when it would be so much easier to say nothing at all, to do more than vote right and work for economic justice for all, to do more than just tolerate our differences and honor and celebrate them, to be impatient with inequality, impatient with anything less than freedom and justice. If we listen for God, we will hear a dangerous voice telling us to do what's right. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for our Sunday morning service. And as we get ready to go our separate ways and begin a new week, let us bow in prayer. Brothers and sisters, as we go to begin a new week, let us listen carefully because God is calling. Let us respond with hope and joy. Let us go out and speak words of love that cause ears to tingle and hearts to leap. Amen.